Day 21, Saturday. Had to go to a catch-up class today because I've been missing so many lectures. I woke up this morning feeling heavy. I didn't sleep too well. My dreams are chaotic, a lunatic showreel of discordant sounds and images. I seem to expel more energy asleep than awake. Regardless, I still had to drag my sorry ass into class this afternoon. Nicole went to work and hardly said goodbye this morning. I'm sure she's cheating on me. Maybe with her manager at work? I don't know, but she's hiding something from me. Class today was pointless. I didn't even absorb anything. I couldn't focus my mind. Is it any wonder? I could hardly hear the lecture over sounds of people breathing, whispering, the scratching of pens against paper, the rattle click of keyboards, the humming of a heating system, footsteps in the hall outside, the shuffling of bodies in their seats, the clothes rustling, people clearing their throats, sighing. I swear I could practically hear their hearts beating. My head hurts. Walking back to Nicole's apartment in the early evening, I felt like the shadows lengthened faster than normal for this time of the year, as if they were reaching out to touch me as I hurried along the quiet streets. I didn't see anyone around, but I felt watched. I'm starting to wish she lived nearer to the college, or at least on the busier side of town. She still isn't home. She should have finished work over an hour ago. What's she up to? Day 22. Sunday. I'm at the end of my chain with Nicole. When I confronted her last night about where she had been for hours after work had finished, she just brushed my questions aside, as if it didn't matter. When I pushed the issue, she snapped at me, said she'd gone to a bar called Catalan with a friend after work. She said she was tired of me always wanting to stay on the weekends, not letting her have any fun. I asked her what friend, a guy friend? She said, so what if it was? I don't get her. Why is she acting like this? I've done everything I can for her, and now she's treating me like I don't matter. Doesn't she understand the only reason I don't want to go out anymore is because I want to protect her, to be alone with her, because I love her? She refused to discuss things any further and went to bed without me. That's what she does when she wants to end a discussion. Just goes to bed, ignores me if I follow her and keep talking. I don't know what to do. I followed her to work today. I know she only went in on Sunday to avoid me. I sat in my car across the street from the coffee shop. All damn day. Nicole seemed so casual, bright and carefree. I couldn't tell she was even thinking about our fight last night. When her manager came out around lunchtime, she was all smiles. He was leaning over her shoulders as she was writing something behind the register. He was way too close and she seemed so comfortable with it. That settles it. I know she's fucking him. Day 23. Monday. I didn't go to my appointment with Dr. Chen today. She never calls when I don't show up. It's like it doesn't make a difference. I don't even know why I'm still writing this journal. But, weirdly, it does seem to help clear my mind. I can get things straight when I write them down. I feel like my brain is full of static right now. After seeing Nicole cosy up to that guy yesterday, I decided to follow her after work in my car. The coffee shop closed at the usual time, and sure enough, she left with him. They got a cab to a bar Nicole had mentioned the other night. Catalan. It looked like a cheap tapas and beers place. A lot of tacky red lights around the entrance. I didn't follow them inside. I just sat in my car and stared at those bright red lights. Even through the glass of my car window, I felt as though I could almost hear, even feel, the buzzing of the electrical fuses inside those crimson bulbs. The vivid, constant brilliance of those red lights seared into my mind, mocking me with the knowledge that just past their glow was the woman I loved and another man, doing God knows what in that tacky low-rent bar. I could feel my heart thumping in my chest, my breathing becoming raspy. I gripped the steering wheel so tight my knuckles went white. The buzz of the electric light was drowned out now so I could hear my pulse bounding in my ears. I was aware of all these things clearly enough to consciously take note of them in my mind, but didn't seem to be able to snap out of it. I felt sick with anger, jealousy, betrayal. I wanted to know how she could do this, what I'd done to deserve this kind of treatment, but at the same time I didn't care to hear any explanation, any empty apologies. I wanted her to know how much she was hurting me. I don't remember much after that. I think I must have driven back to Nicole's apartment and slept on the couch. That's where I woke up anyway. After a quick glance into the still dark bedroom, 
I saw that she had come home and gone to bed without me. Again. It was then that I realised I wasn't wearing the same jeans and shirt I had on yesterday. I changed some point last night. I also had a headache and my mouth tasted gross. I couldn't remember what I'd done when I got back to the apartment. Checking the kitchen though, sure enough there was an almost empty bottle of Jameson's on the counter and in the washing machine were my clothes from the previous night, still wet from washing. Then, I had a terrible thought. Had I been so jealous of what I'd seen last night that I decided to go out myself, get drunk and cheat on the coal? I remembered a while back when I cheated on this girl I'd been dating. We didn't have anything special, but I still wanted to avoid the drama of getting caught, so I washed all my clothes from the previous night before she came over to guarantee that there would be no lipstick marks or telltale smells of perfume on my clothes from the other chick. I went into the bathroom to take a piss and brushed the rank taste of the night before out of my mouth. I glanced into the mirror over the sink and noticed a few red marks on my cheek and neck. <sighs> Fuck. I must have hooked up with some other chick. I have entirely no memory of who, though. The marks were a bright crimson red, a colour way too slightly to be Nicole's lipstick. They reminded me of the glow of the red lights outside the bar Catalan. My whole mind seems to be filled with that red right now. It hurts my head. I'm pretty sure Nicole figured out what I did last night and that's why she's ignoring me. <sighs> Fuck. Day 24. Tuesday. Jace called me this morning and insisted I'd come out and meet him. I didn't want to, but Nicole still isn't speaking to me. She's just lying in her bed and won't even respond when I try and talk to her. Her little grotesque figurine isn't on the dresser where it normally is. She must have taken it to bed with her to talk to her about what I did. I think she's really upset with me. If she's figured out that I cheated on her, I'm not surprised. How could I have been such a moron? Anyway, I couldn't stand sitting in the apartment in silence. TV hurts my head and I can't concentrate enough to make a start on any of the huge piles of neglected college works I've left sitting on the coffee table. So, I met up with Jace. None of our other friends were there, which I was kind of grateful about. Jace kept giving me weird, freaky looks out the corner of his eye, like he expected me to burst into flames or something. He seemed totally on edge around me. I don't get it. I tried to explain a little about what was going on, but he didn't seem to follow any of what I was telling him, even though I'm sure I was explaining it as clearly as possible. It was like we were talking different languages. Anyway, after a couple of hours, he said he had to get back to his dorm. He had an assignment to do but insisted if I needed to talk again, I just had to text or call. Sure, Jace, I'll call if I need to talk to someone who will just give me creeped out looks and hardly respond. Thanks a lot. Now, here I feel the need to jump in again and provide a little dose of reality. I remember that day with Pat as clear as crystal. I should do. It was the last time him and I spent any time together. I did not think I was acting strangely towards him. If I was, I'm sincerely sorry that it made him feel he couldn't talk to me. But you need to understand, he was rambling gibberish. Most of what he said was just broken sentences, paranoia and resentment leaking through between the nonsense. He was jumpy, and that made me jumpy. He wouldn't maintain eye contact when I was talking to him. He'd appear to be listening and then suddenly whirl around to stare behind him, and you'd realise he'd actually been totally ignoring you. Listening out for... something... Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore. I made my excuse and left. I really meant it when I told him to call or text, though. Of course, he never did. Day 25, Wednesday. I'm starting to feel like this journal is the only place I can talk about what's going on in my life. I don't feel safe talking to anyone. Not my friends, not Dr. Chen. I've decided not to return to my sessions with her. It was after I started that so-called counselling all of this shit started to happen. She hasn't been in touch since I stopped attending either, and I've realised I don't even have her phone number. <laughs> Whatever. Nicole won't say a damn word to me. I think... I think she's depressed. She hasn't gotten out of bed the whole time I've been here. I went out for a walk earlier and tried to clear my head. Just a brief one. Though as the streets around here seem shadier than normal to me, she must have gotten up while I was out and gone back to bed. I feel so alone, and yet still somehow watched. 
The shadows in the apartment seem darker than is natural. I've begun to dread sunlight. Daylight seems to be my only friend now. As soon as night comes, I have to rely on electric light. I am tortured by the buzzing of the fuses, and I swear the lights dim and flicker as and when they choose. It creates more shadow than is necessary, and not just shades of grey. As I sit here and write this, I am convinced that just out of the corner of my eye, in the darkness, there is too much dark, blacker than anything found in nature. The kind of pitch that comes from a shadow concealing something. And I know that if I stare direct into it, my eyes will eventually focus, revealing nothing. But for some reason, I can't force myself to turn and look. My spine is frozen, because if I do turn, I will have shown fear, and whatever is watching me, wherever it is, will know I am scared. Day 27. Friday. You started watching me during the day now. I can't even sleep on the couch with the blinds drawn, and sunlight pouring into the living room. I am still watched. Nicole still acts as though I don't exist, just lying in bed, not responding to anything I say. I pace her apartment, trying to relieve some of the frustration and anxiety. I'm beginning to feel crushed beneath the guilt, the confusion, and the fear. I know she knows what I did, and she told that fucking grotesque creature. I don't know where it is, it's still missing from that spot on the dresser. I can see most of the bedside table from the bedroom door, even in half light. And it isn't there either. I'm beginning to feel convinced that it is the presence I can sense watching me, following me with its dreadful beady eyes. I can see, or perhaps even feel, the outline of its hideous deformed features in the shadows in every corner of every room. Its bony contorted form disappearing just behind a turn in the corridor or evaporating from view in the, in the crack of a door left ajar. Always there always gone as soon as I get it within my line of sight. And although the figurine was only ever a few inches high, I swear, I swear, it's growing, feeding on my fear. I can smell it too. This foul odour has begun to gradually taint the whole apartment. It's trying to drive me insane with anxiety and exhaustion. It's punishing me for hurting Nicole. Day 28. Saturday. I cried today. I cried the agonising, hysterical tears of despair. Nicole won't talk to me. But I cannot bring myself to approach her in bed, to demand a response, sh to shake her violently until she looks at me. I'm too ashamed, too crippled with my own self-loathing, that I am the one who, though through my selfish actions, pushed her into depression so deep she cannot move from her bed. I still haven't slept. I barely close my eyes for more than a fraction of a second. I can't afford to let my guard down. It's getting closer. The grotesque had grown overnight. Yesterday, it was a flicker. A silhouette, never taller than the natural extended shadow of the figurine. It would sneak behind corners and watch me with its empty, black eyes. Its rancid, sweet stink wafting in and filling my nostrils, burning my throat. Today, its smell is filling the apartment. But I didn't see it all day. I just stayed in the sunlight, the rays warming my skin and banishing the excess shadows, but not calming me. I haven't eaten in several days. I haven't been able to eat. It is making me weak. While in the comparative safety of sunlight, I went into the kitchen and tried to eat a sandwich. It tasted of hardly anything. Swallowing was difficult. The muscles in my throat didn't seem to want to cooperate. After gulping down a glass of water to try and flush the food into my stomach, I was overcome with nausea. I sprinted to the bathroom and dropped to my knees, hugging the cold porcelain bowl, the rough chunks of my only meal for three days forcing their way back up my gullet. The water I drank, still cold as it flooded my mouth and splashed into the toilet. After spitting a couple of times and clearing my throat, I got back up shakily onto my feet. I turned the cold water on in the sink and washed my face. As I straightened up and looking into the bathroom mirror, I felt my heart lurch in my chest. I blinked and it was gone, but there was no denying. For that sliver of a fraction of a second, there was the figure of the grotesque behind me, just outside the bathroom door. Its crooked form stood taller than any human now, long limbs and 
pallid body, crouching almost double under the confines of the apartment ceiling. Its low slung jaw gaping wide, revealing the vicious jagged teeth of no earthly creature. Its carnivorous mouth, like a black hole into oblivion, waiting to swallow all living things. It seemed almost eyeless, only two slightly shining points in its huge, warped, waxy head. No iris or pupils to follow, but there was no question that it was staring directly at me. Before my brain could comprehend the instinctive terror of the prey searing through my body, like shards of ice piercing outward from my heart, it was gone again. I stood there, motionless, breathless, for what seemed like an eternity before I had the courage to peer, trembling into the corridor to see nothing. The smell of it is overpowering now. I could hardly breathe, but I still tried to beg for forgiveness from the coal, in the hope that she would call the thing off. I approached her bedside. It was so dark, I reached my hand out to hold hers. All I felt was the cold, moist skin of the grotesque under my fingers. I ran from the room, feeling the shadows writhe around me. I know that to try and leave would only anger the thing more. Oh, please, God, help me. Protect me from the vengeance of this creature. I'm so sorry for what I've done. Don't let it punish me any further. Day 28. Saturday night. I concede. I'm a wreck. I am broken. The grotesque has won, and rightly so. Nicole... Nicole told me that she told it everything, and that it would protect her. It has seen inside of me. Its hollow eyes have violated my very soul and it has found me unworthy of her. I am doomed by my own actions. It will never leave me. She will not leave her bed, and I cannot leave this apartment, even if someone comes to find us. I i am beyond help now. That was the last entry posted in the journal. From the date on it, I could see that it was only six days before the police eventually broke down the door to Nicole's apartment. A neighbour had complained of a foul smell seeping under the door and through the walls, and her manager at the coffee shop, who she was clearly friendly with, began asking in the building if anyone knew where she was. Eventually someone called the police. Pat's parents were called, obviously, and they called me, I suppose, for moral support, as we had been best friends, and we visited him in the hospital. The police said that upon forcing the door of the apartment, they had been hit with a wave of sickening, putrid air, and they had found Pat, curled up in a corner of the living room, unwashed and half-starved, every light in the apartment switched on. He was mumbling to himself, his eyes wide and roaming around the walls, seemingly unaware of the police intrusion, until they tried to help him to his feet, whereupon he began thrashing wildly, screaming, not to be punished. This had confused them at first, until they continued their sweep of the apartment and entered the bedroom, which it was obvious was the source of the horrific and overpowering smell. Swinging the door inward as massive cloud of flies was disturbed and filled the air, landing on walls and ceiling, forming pulsating black shadows. Approaching the bed, they saw what appeared to be a figure asleep, until someone switched on the overhead light. It was the body of Nicole, at an advanced stage of decomposition, her flesh nearly liquefied and saturating the bed sheets. Her dark brown hair was a tangled mess spread over the pillow swept back to reveal the obvious cause of death. Blunt force trauma to the skull. The entire right side of her head caved in with what appeared to be a small but heavy white stone figurine. She had apparently put up something of a fight as her fingernails were split from clawing at her attacker. The cream-coloured wallpaper was stained a brownish red with a huge splatter marks of now crumbling congealed blood, as she had obviously been struck several times with the ornament. Pat was immediately arrested and taken directly to hospital. I felt utterly useless sitting in the uncomfortable plastic chair under fluorescent hospital lighting, looking at the figure strapped to the bed. I didn't recognise him. I could hardly understand a word he said. I picked out red and grotesque. That's about it. I wasn't going to be any help to his parents, or the police. I told them everything I could, but I don't think it amounted to much. Someone had tried to find contact details of the Dr. Chen I informed them that Pat had been seeing, but there was no listed phone number, and nobody could find any records of a counsellor 
or a therapist locally under that name. She seemed to have disappeared, as if she never existed in the first place. Since nobody else ever saw her, it now seems entirely possible that she was just a figment of what was turning out to be Pat's very fractured mind. As far as anyone could tell, Pat had gone insane with jealousy, bludgeoning Nicole to death that night after she got home from the bar, whether he was already drunk when he killed her was up for debate. But he had certainly gotten drunk and, either before or afterward, proceeded to wash his bloodstained clothes and cut off all contact with the outside world, convincing himself that she was just sleeping. Even now, he didn't seem to be aware of what he had done, concerned more about being pursued by some creature. Initially, police and doctors that assumed his impassioned pleas to not be punished were directed at the authorities in relation to his crime. It is only now that I begin to hear them echoing in my mind, in an entirely different context. The press obviously got wind of the bizarre nature of the incident, and by the second night Pat was under observation, there are a couple of reporters loitering in the hospital lobby. I ducked by them quickly, but glancing back saw that Pat's parents weren't as quick and had been cornered. I felt a painful lump in my throat as I saw their faces, twisted in confusion and grief, as they were bombarded with questions. I began to walk back, to try and offer some kind of distraction to the reporters, so that, so that perhaps Pat's mother and father could slip away unnoticed. Is it true he smashed her head in with a gargoyle? crudely demanded one of the reporters, pushing forward a recorder. No, I interrupted before Pat's father had a chance to tell the reporter to fuck off, or even take a deserving swipe at the man's head. I think... I think it's called a grotesque. To my knowledge, the object is still sitting in an evidence locker somewhere. Though I know it had no power in itself, I can't help but take some comfort in the knowledge that it is locked away forever.